G'day, AB here from Sportsnet fans. And listen, I'm super excited because footy's over, it's time for tennis. And that means, of course, Australian Open 2012. Today, I'm not here to talk about packages. I'm not here to talk about tickets or special deals. Today is purely a chance to get to see a little bit of behind the scenes of the operations of Australian Open as they prepare for Australian Open 2012, the hundredth time the Australian Open's men title has been up for grabs. So we're going to head inside and see who we can talk to. We may be lucky enough to get a few officials or maybe some coaches and just see what goes on to make our tournament the Grand Slam of Asia Pacific and of course the players favourite. Well, what better place to start, folks, than right at the top? I've got with me the Tournament Director for Australian Open 2012, and you have been for many years, Craig Tiley. Thanks so much for your time. Adrian, good to be here. Good to Absolutely. have a chat. Oh, fantastic. Now, we've been involved with you for quite a lot of years, and, yeah. and we love the game, we love the tournament. It is the player's favourite. Yeah. Why is it your favourite? How did you get involved in this? Well, you know, I've, I've actually been very lucky because uh, I've had an opportunity really the last five years to be in this role. And I was asked by Steve Wood, our CEO, if I'd step into the role as a tournament director, and I said, sure. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of fun. Very exciting. Now, tell me, were you a tennis fan well before you came into this role, or yeah, did I, it develop through your career? I know nothing else in my life <laughs> other than tennis. <laughs> so I've been lucky. I you know, coached tennis for a long time, ran tennis business, and was living in the United States, actually, originally from South Africa, yep. but living in the US, and, uh, and came to Australia six years ago now. And, uh, uh, as director of tennis and, uh, and then the role of the tournament director was added as well. So really the last five and a half, six years have been fantastic and uh, it's a privilege to be part of the team that runs the event. It's a large team. We have over 4,000 uh, staff that during the event of January uh, are here uh, running it and then uh, and during the year our staff, full-time staff about 100. So it's a really big event. In fact, it's the largest annual sporting event in the Southern Hemisphere and one of the largest events in the world. It is amazing. Now, you mentioned the staff that you have, and, and we all know the ball boys, the ball kids, I should say, sorry, yeah, yeah. the volunteers, they love it. You see the smiles on their faces and their parents are so proud. Now, you love tennis, but this is now your career. So, does the gloss somehow disappear because it's such hard work, or do you still really love coming to work every day, especially through the Open? No, I think people are lucky when they, when they do something that they're very passionate about and they love. And I love the sport of tennis, but more importantly, I love the people I work with. So, every day I show up, and yes, there's a lot of pressure in January, and it's long hours, but every day I show up is really, not only it's a privilege to be here, but it's also just a lot of fun. So, you know, I feel like I haven't worked a day in my life. In fact, I, my, my, my father used to ask me questions. He you know, said, you still in tennis? When are you going to start working? And I said, well, you know, I am in tennis. I'm having a blast. Absolutely. If you can make a living doing what you love, as you say, it's a, it's a perfect scenario. Now, I want to ask something uh, that has been in the news lately. Flushing Meadows. Yes. A roof. Surely they've got to do it. I mean, uh, uh, Melbourne Park sort of led the way with that technology and it's yeah. made the tournament probably a lot less headaches for you being able to make those calls. What do you think about Flushing Meadows and, and putting a roof on that centre court? Well, I think nowadays uh, being able to have continuous play is critically important and the weather changing patterns and you know, it's really hard with, uh, and they've had a lot of unfortunate rain. I think the last four years they've had to, uh, in New York, they've had to schedule the finals on to the next day, or the Monday. So from our point of view, we're lucky we've got Rod Lave Arena, we've got Hisense with a roof that can open and close whenever we want. And now we're about to add Margaret Court Arena with the same mm. thing. So we'll have three stadiums and there won't be an event or facility in the world that will have that luxury. So we're fortunate. I know Flushing Meadow, we, we, we talk to them, we talk to the US Open a lot, they're good friends of ours. And I know they'd like nothing more than to have a stadium that can have a roof. And I think they're working on it. Absolutely. Now, you are off, uh, we, we mentioned off air before, you're off, off to Istanbul. Um, yeah. Later today, I believe, yeah. or, or yeah. tomorrow. Uh, so your role is not specifically locked in to Melbourne Park or Olympic Park, is it? You, you tend to travel the world. Yeah. No, absolutely. And again, that's a lot of fun too. And not necessarily going to Istanbul to put my feet up and uh, and lay on the beach, uh, although it's winter up there now. But we've got it's the year-end championships for the Women's uh, Tennis Association. So we're going to go there, continue to build the relationships with the playing group. There's a few meetings, and and the same thing with the men at the end of November. And, you know, again, uh, one of the things at the Australian Open that we really have prided ourselves on is the fact that we are we are the player's favourite place to play. So we spend a lot of time and energy on continuing to maintain and build the, rela up the relationships with the players. We're in the official players' cafe here for Australian Open 2012. We could stay here and have a coffee, but I reckon it might not be a bad idea if, with your permission, we go and have a look at the locker rooms and uh, see what the boys and girls deal with in there before each match. No, we sure can. And actually, it's pretty, pretty busy here this morning. We're doing construction on the other side of the camera, which people can't see, but 
and that's uh, just to refurbish the, this play area. This is probably the third time in the last five years we've done a refurbishment of the player lounge, the player cafe, as well as the player locker rooms. And we do that again, continue to upgrade it, continue to make it you know, a great place for the players to come and be and feel relaxed and, uh, and leave Australia that they felt like they've had a really good time. Actually, before we go on that, yeah. And this is off the record, no one's watching, no one's listening. Yeah. But are there any players that you can tell us with crazy dietary requirements or requests that they put into the cafe every day? Like does someone just eat blue M&Ms or, or someone must have two kilos of spinach a day? Is there anything strange like that? Well, I think the balance between strange dietary requests and superstitions is an interesting one. Yep. The, uh, what we do provide in, in the Play Cafe, a whole range of foods. So whether it be gluten-free, or whether it be blue M&Ms you're talking about. <laughs> is that, so the players could come in, they get really anything they want. In fact, new this year, we're going to have a pasta bowl, a live pasta station, a uh, barista here for making coffee. So we'll have some other special um, uh, you know, food experiences for, for the players. But, but I think it's more around superstitions. If you watch someone like uh, Rafa Nadal, he's uh, uh, very meticulous with his routine. And there's certain things that he does you know, at a certain time. And uh, if you watch him sitting at the court, for example, is that when he, he's got a, his water bottle and he's got uh, his, his juice that uh, he uses for energy, and uh, he'll take a sip of the water bottle and screw the cap on and put it down and position the water bottle in the exact same position he picked it up from. And then he'll take the juice, the same thing, screw the cap off, take a sip, put it down, and he'll make sure they both sit in the exact same spots, facing the same way each time. So. So that's just one that you can see publicly, but yep. many of the players do have superstitions. Some of them have superstitions about what type of food they eat before a match and how long they eat before a match. And, but we, we let them you know, make that decision themselves because there's over 500 players in here yep. uh, during the Open. So we just make sure we cover everything so we can cater for them. Very diplomatic, no secrets uh, are coming out today. But can you imagine, I mean you mentioned a barista, can you imagine Rafa with extra caffeine in his system? Well, That'd just be crazy. I yeah. mean, how many times would he pull that wedgie out and he'd bounce the ball and the whole thing? It'd be out of control. Yeah, well, he doesn't need any more energy. But, uh, <laughs> but there are some that uh, that probably need a little bit of coffee. Um, and, you know, with long days we have. Yeah, and, exactly. And finish, finish late matches. Yep. And I think the playing group generally, uh, this is they're professional. So their routine that they have during January and their routine throughout the year is fairly consistent. And we do a lot of research during the year to make sure that there's, if there's any changes in that routine, we can cover it here in January. And that's why. You know, staying close to the playing group is important for us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what makes you the best. It does. Excellent. Should we go after the locker room? Yes, let's, let's do go. It.